Good morning and good afternoon, um, and welcome to our conversation today on backhaul, frontal, exhaul, everything it takes to get the capacity of the RAN and uh, into the network. Um, and uh, we're talking about how this evol is evolving um, with the introduction of uh, uh, CRAN and hence a bigger demand of front hole, uh, more capacity that it's needed in Iran and lower latencies. And uh, I'm talking today to Jim uh, Gillette, uh, who works uh, product marketing at Nokia. Uh, Jim, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Monica. It's my pleasure. Excellent. Well, let's start by talking about uh, giving a brief introduction on uh, what Nokia is doing in this space. Right. Well, you know, Nokia is an end-to-end -end infrastructure provider, and mobile is something we've been doing since the beginning. Um, when I think earlier in my career to the days of T1s and E1s, uh, well, that those days are long past. Now it's uh, we've adopted IP and uh, and Ethernet, and uh, you know, it's it's been. It's been an exciting challenge, and uh, we continue to do good work here. Absolutely, and you actually, if I remember correctly, you, Nokia started with TVs, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. it's been, it's even longer than that before the time that was not even wireless uh, at all. Um, okay, so maybe can we talk about how has backhaul, you know, um, evolution, and what what is the transition that we have gone through, and what's what's happening today? Right. Well, with the introduction of LTE, uh, you know, in uh, the last decades, around 2008, 2009, um, there was a decided shift towards more IP uh, backhaul as opposed to, you know, more voice or TDM-centric backhaul. So that began a shift in architecture where we went away from sort of circuit switching into packet switching. Um, and that drove uh, increasing use of IP. Uh, of course, capacities went up. Uh, so we had to transform our optical infrastructure and microwave infrastructure to carry those those packets. Uh, you know, more recently, uh, the continued growth uh, of, of traffic on mobile networks is driving yet again uh, an evolution, especially now with LTE Advanced, where we're now looking at new RAN architectures to uh, to improve even further the uh, the wireless spectrum capacity and take costs out of the uh, cell sites themselves, and that and that's really touching on uh, front hall. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, what, what about uh, the optical front hall specifically? How has that changed? Well, what's, what's, uh, what's changed, I guess, most recently? I mean, front hall isn't necessarily new. It's been around for several years. It, it's, its primary purpose is to allow the baseband unit, uh, which traditionally is distributed at the cell site, to be, have them centralized located in sort of central locations so that they now can control multiple remote radio heads. And to do that, you have to get the SIPRI traffic or offside traffic from the remote radio head at the cell site, and you've got to get it back to this central height where you can, sorry, central site where you can process it. Right, right, right. Um, what about in terms of technologies? What, what's, what's new there? Well, it started out with uh, just point-to-point -point fiber, uh, but as everybody knows, fiber is not uh, readily available everywhere, and uh, and it tends to be rather expensive. So the first uh, the first variants were to multiplex uh, many of these SIPRI or OBSI links uh, using uh, WDM, um, and then more recently we've added capabilities to uh, support uh, performance monitoring, alarm monitoring, management channels as well as doing some color translation to allow better cost uh, performance uh, on, the, on the optics actually used in the radio head equipment and in the baseband units. Now, let's talk about, you know, fiber availability. You know, there is, you know, an increasing amount of fiber, obviously, out there. We want to reach more. Um, so what is, what is the, the, the challenge for operators? Are, they, are we going to get to a point where fiber is going to connect to every cell, um, I mean, the, for the macro, by and large, that is the case, but when you talk to small cells, it's a different picture. Um, or do we need something else that is not fiber? So let's talk about first about the, the demand, what is out there. Is it feasible to think that we're gonna have fiber to every single cell out there? Yeah, I mean, you know, predicting the future is always difficult. Uh, it, it, I think the answer is the diversity of cell sites is so vast that you're going to require all sorts of different technologies and a lot of flexibility to wire up or interconnect all the cell sites back to the packet core and so forth. So 
Um, you know, the challenge we have with Cipri and OBSI is the fact that in a macro, uh, the capacity scales uh, per sector and per carrier. So if you have a macro site with three carriers and three sectors, you're looking at nine links. Um, and further, when the bandwidth uh, or the spectrum width being used, you know, hits 20 megahertz and larger, you're talking about a massive amount of traffic to be backhauled. And then the question is, how far can you back all it to that central site? I mean, ideally, you'd like to have those central sites managing as many base stations as possible. So you run into issues if you don't have fiber uh, because of the latency issue and with the sheer volume of traffic that has to be interconnected. Um, you know, if you don't have fiber available, well, you know, and perhaps GPON's an option if it's there. If it's not, then for macro cell, uh, you know, microwave gives you somewhat limited choices in that environment. And it may be something that you say, perhaps not today, we do central RAN for these sites uh, and we plan to deliver fiber to them in future or perhaps look towards some other technology to, to bring them toward a more central RAN and leading to cloud RAN in future. Right, and uh, okay, so, so there is uh, the issue is that you cannot get uh, fiber everywhere and uh, the capacity on wireless can be limited. And, but at the same, also at the same time, when you think about small cells, it's no longer a single channel because you might have Wi-Fi, you can have unlicensed, you can have a, a neutral host where you have multiple operators to the same side that share backhaul. And then with 5G, you might have, you know, millimeter waves. So, the, the capacity and the latency part, it's, uh, it, in terms of requirements, is becoming more stringent. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely true. And, you know, fiber is the best medium if you have it. Uh, there are some cases, uh, again, I mentioned GPON as an option. Um, but also, you know, if you are in some of the small cell requirements, if, if the bandwidth is low and it's single sector, there are some niche opportunities where microwave can be used. But I think in the main, if you're looking at where the macro evolution is going, um, you're either going to have to pull fiber or we're going to have to uh, develop some new technology as we move forward. Right. Okay. So if you have fiber, go for it. If you don't have fiber, try to use whichever wireless uh, technology is, is better suited. Um, what, what are the options there? But well, you know, if, if uh, I mean, they're within the radio networks themselves, there are many uh, levers that can be pulled to improve cell site performance and intercell interference. Uh, you know, one of a former boss told me many years ago, there's as much art as there is science in, uh, in defining and optimizing a radio network. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you look at where people are thinking in terms of 5G and an architecture where you have fixed and mobile coming together, uh, wireline and wireless all sort of converged um, and and leveraging a lot of cloud technologies for the processing, uh, it becomes pretty clear that there's a way we can improve the, uh, the, 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 the need or the transport requirements to get the radio ahead information to these centralized locations by looking at something other than CIPRI and, and OPSI. Because when you think about it, those, uh, those standards are now almost 15 years old and, and we're never really designed in that time frame to solve the problem we're looking at today. Absolutely. And, and so as we move to a centralized or a, a remote baseband location, front hall becomes more important. And with that, uh, clearly the ability of uh, I mean the need for, for capacity, huge amounts of capacity for, for front hall. Um, and as you say, simply might or might not be the right interface. So what, what are the choices there? What, what do you see happening? Yeah, well, well, this is actually happening in the radio network itself, where we're looking at new architectures. In, in essence, with front hall today over fiber, which works, uh, but what you're essentially doing is you're bringing back to a central site the, an, the, the antenna signal itself, um, which is massive and has the, has the latency requirements. So what, what, what RAN architects are looking at doing is can we keep the real-time processing requirements at the cell site by the radio uh, and only pull back to the centralized location, sort of the non-real-time processing. And if we can do that, then, then the latency requirement and the amount of bandwidth is somewhat relaxed. And then that opens the door 
uh, for other technologies like microwave to come in quite easily now and accommodate that. So I think you'll see a transition uh, where you'll use fiber where you can and you can start today because it's there and it works. Uh, with optical front hall, and then we'll transition to what do we call a, a mid hall type capability. But it's it's where now the interface is Ethernet, and and Ethernet can be used uh, transport wise to carry the traffic back. But there are different ways in which you can use Ethernet, right? So it's not has, it is a you know is it CPRI or well a full front hall or I you say mid hall? But there are different options for that and. Uh, there is no free lunch. So uh, if, you, if you do Ethernet and you do a functional split, you, there is some uh, pay price you have to pay in terms of performance. So is, is there an ideal medium, an, an ideal choice in there, or it really depends on what you're trying to achieve? Well, our, our view has always been that the diversity of the sites uh, require a lot of flexibility in the approaches you take. Um, if I look at backhaul, for instance, uh, we have long proposed that you should view backhaul as an IP network layer service. Um, so you have end-to-end -end an IP operational model. So OAM end-to-end -to, -end to, uh, to, to confirm and operate. Your, and of course, it's the same operational model that you may be using with your residential customers and your business services. So it's a nice uniform environment. Now IP itself requires a transport medium and can run over microwave, optical, or fixed networks. So you have a choice now of whatever physical medium you need to reach each site. You can pick and choose and intermix. You have common IP over top and with appropriate network management, you're able to correlate one to the other so that any alarms that do occur can be cross-correlated. But you know, at the end of the day, an operator has a unified provisioning model and an operational model to, to roll out cell sites quickly and then debug them if there's issues. I think if I look at mid-haul, the same, the same thing is it's, you're now dealing again with Ethernet packets. Ethernet can be run over microwave, uh, optical, or fixed networks. So it's, it's very similar. In fact, it becomes more like traditional backhaul and less that sort of specialized case of pure optical front hall of the Cyprian off-site traffic. Mm -hmm. And so there, there seems to be like a continuum between front hall and back hall, and maybe the distinction is no longer one or the other, but it's you just pick and choose whichever layer you need to have in terms of the, the, the interface is used. Right, yeah, I, I think if you look towards 5G, what, what we see happening is this notion of a of a fabric, a transport fabric that, that interconnects, you know, everyone and, and everything. Uh, and this fabric is comprised of multiple layers, uh, wavelengths, uh, microwave links, uh, packetization on top of that, ethernet, and then possibly IP on top of that. I mean, wide area networks have long been multi-layered. That will continue. It gives you the option to carry the traffic and switch or route the traffic at the appropriate level using whichever medium you need and you know the trick in all this is is to manage that with a unified environment so operationally it's simplified even though the individual components you know the price you pay for all that flexibility uh, is some complexity but operationally you simplify it through the management plane is it going to be e uh, easier to have interoperability with ethernet because that's that's a, a complaint you hear all the time about CPRI that is standard based but not necessarily interoperable Oh, absolutely. I mean, the beautiful thing about Ethernet is it now opens up not only to a uh, mobile operator doing the backhaul or the, or the mid-haul themselves, but you can now take advantage of, of uh, Ethernet transport providers and, and other capabilities. So there, there's no question. Plus, as I mentioned, the big thing is uh, you can now use microwave. And, yes. you know, when you think today more than half the cell sites uh, are probably microwave connected, that's pretty important to make sure that that can be worked. Now, even if you do have fiber, sometimes it's actually quite expensive. And uh, uh, for operators, what you're seeing, especially with the small cells, the cost of the back hole slash front hole is, is higher in terms of the per percentage of the, uh, of the cost. Um, what, what, would you, what do you see in terms of TCO, in terms of being efficient with, with, the, with the money you invest in the, in the infrastructure? Right. Well, you know, what we generally find is the operational costs that tend to drive uh, the biggest portion of an operator's expense. Uh, I, I mentioned a few things in backhaul about if you know you use the IP uh, model 
uh, you have a common operational environment, common OAM, uh, from cell site to, uh, to packet core, even if you're running over some third-party transport provider's infrastructure. And it's the same model that can be used for your, your residential and business customers. So there's, there's a cost savings that comes from adopting a single operational model. If you look at front hall itself, um, you know, using uh, WDM to, to multiplex multiple CIPRI OBSI links onto a single fiber, uh, you know, that, that certainly reduces the cost of having to rent, as I said, up to nine individual fibers uh, for a three sector, three carrier macro. Um, you can then, uh, for incremental cost, I think we've done, some, uh, we've done some numbers on this, for about a 2% increase in the front hall optical equipment, uh, you can add in a, uh, an OAM channel. Um, so you can now manage end to end out to the far site as well let's start to introduce protection switching because again with all this traffic uh, serving all these customers the expectation for always on service becomes pretty important um, and the other thing that we can do is again for another uh, incremental cost we can translate the colors that are provided uh, between the radio head and the baseband unit so that they can deploy less expensive black and white optics and use the optical equipment we provide to do the color translation so that they can in fact be multiplexed together and, uh, and then come out the other end. Is there any fundamental difference in the way you do the front hole back, uh, front hole back hole for small cells and macro cells? Well, you know, with, with small cells, uh, you know, I mean, right off the top, right, there's environmental issues uh, in, in the sense of, you know, macros can be on the top of tall buildings in secure huts with lots of keys and, and security cameras. Uh, small cells can be at street level in bus shelters. Uh, so right out of the gate, you have security issues that, that you have to deal with. So robustness and shrouds and, and sometimes uh, requirements to actually hide or, or if you will, mask the street level equipment so it doesn't become an eye, uh, sorry, an eyesore you know, the municipality that govern it. Um, connecting backhaul, let alone power, to, uh, to small cells uh, sites can be a challenge as well. It's a little different, again, when, when it's the top of a building or at a tower in, in a field. Um, so you have to deal with different site requirements and, again, optimize the platforms you provide to fit right uh, and, and meet the right price points. I guess the last thing I'd say on that as well is, again, with with small cells, you do tend to be talking about smalling, smaller serving areas. So the distances you travel may be less. And depending on how many sectors, it's not uncommon to have single sector small cells. The amount of traffic that you transport is less. So it's, it is, if you will, similar in concept, but the specifics couldn't be more different. Right, so you're trying to achieve a similar thing, but the, 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 I guess the reality is different. So you have to deal with, with, with that. Now, <clears throat> that, that um, reasons think about millimeter wave, which is a, a very hot topic right now. Um, and <clears throat> that can be used both for the backhaul and for, for access. Um, now, in terms of backhaul, is millimeter wave going to help? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we have a whole range of microwave options now from sort of sub six gigahertz to the more standard eight to 30 gigahertz range. And then we have higher uh, up to 60 and 80 gigahertz thing. All of these, uh, in our mind, they introduce, you know, if you will, more tools in the toolbox. Uh, each has different propagation characteristics, dispersion characteristics, and so forth. There may be regulatory issues in using the spectrum, uh, but it all adds up to what we'll call a full solution set, which, again, if I just go back to my theme, that, you know, in my I view doing front hall, back hall, you know, the interconnection of RAN sites, I think is probably the most complex networking challenge we face today. Just the sheer diversity on the physical, the capacity, the latency issues, power issues. It's, uh, it's actually a lot of fun to work in. Right, absolutely. Um, now, um, what about uh, uh, self back hall? Because you can use like millimeter wave both for access and, uh, and back hall. Do you see much of an opportunity there? Well, we continue to see trials and, and, and innovations in that space. Uh, I haven't seen too many actual commercial deployments at large scale at this point. But, you know, in this industry, you know, again, the diversity is good. Uh, we'll find its niche. As, as someone once said to me, the ultimate goal here is to find technology that solves a problem. 
that solves more problems than it makes mm -hmm. and is available at a price customers prepared to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get that combination right, then you've got a winner. And I think we're still looking at self-backhaul, but it's certainly not, uh, it's not been deemed uh, uh, unusable by any stretch, but we're still looking to find that exact business model and the exact use case where it just fits perfectly. And again, with 5G on the horizon, the, the demands for diversity go up, not shrink. There's even mm -hmm. more use cases coming. So having even more tools in that toolbox will be important. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, you, 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 there is more flexibility, but more complexity, but you need it in order to address all the demand out there in the, in the most cost effective uh, uh, way. Now, as we move, let's, let's move a little bit, look at uh, a little bit of the future. Um, so there is, uh, uh, with 5G, there is an increase in importance of latency. How is that, is that going to also affect the, the solutions that we're looking in terms of front haul and back haul? Well, latency is there because uh, it, you know, the idea of 5G is the broader use cases it'll support. Some of these will be more what we'll call command and control type applications where latency, uh, you know, is, is critical. It can mean the difference between, you know, life and death and so forth without, without being overly dramatic. Um, so we know with optical uh, front hall uh, today, we can, we can address those latency requirements. But, but the latency issue won't go away. It'll, it'll continue to be there and probably get more stringent. So looking at new RAN architectures where we separate that baseband processing and, and we split, if you will, the real-time processing from the non-real-time processing, um, that will lend itself more and more to lower latency requirements. I think the other thing about 5G is a lot of the processing in 5G is being designed to be uh, to operate within cloud infrastructure. And what that means is we're taking a lot of processing and we're starting to sort of disaggregate and deconstruct functions that we normally would saw sitting on sort of a dedicated server in a, in a specific location and it ran there forever. Now what we're going to start seeing are smaller functions that can spin up uh, anytime on demand and in any location based on the application that's being uh, used or use case being run over the 5G network. And that has a lot of ramifications on the front hall, back hall, the network generally that uh, that we have to deal with. Yeah, and I guess mobile edge computing is also going to have an impact in that as well. Well, well, absolutely, right? Because because when you, when we have a bit of a disconnect between, uh, you know, networks uh, that were designed, say, in the last couple decades, you, you assumed or you designed it around the idea that your server uh, ran or applications ran on a dedicated server in a fixed location forever. And so your network didn't have to worry about moving or addressing uh, that. Uh, now, we did have mobile uh, phones and, and we developed technology that allowed us to, you know, do handoffs. That all worked. When, when you move towards, you know, cloud infrastructure, then the network has to better respond uh, to, to interconnect now on demand with the same agility as cloud-based applications spin up. And, and this is software-defined networking. Uh, and you know, we're, we're, we're leaders in software-defined. We're, we're shipping that capability now for data centers and for wide area networks. And uh, you know, in time, it will interwork with this sort of interconnecting fabric that will hook in everyone and everything and with that automation between sort of the packet core uh, and in a cloud and a network, we see a, a much greater control integration and automation so that the network's always there when the applications are there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now to, to close up, uh, we talked a lot about CPRI and um, is, is there a future for it with 5G? Or are well, we gonna move to something else? <laughs> Look, you know, with all these things, uh, you know, when, when a customer makes an investment, um, you know, there's an expectation that it have a certain life cycle and CIPRI will run its course. Uh, when, when, you know, that operator chooses to do RAN uh, refurbishment or, 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 modernization, or uh, modernization, you know, they may decide at some point to switch over to a new technology. Um, you know, what, what is driving our industry right now is just the sheer capacity of traffic. And there's so much more traffic that can come still on, on the mobile networks. I mean, we're just barely touching the video tsunami 
Uh, there's so much more that can be done in terms of streaming video and also user-generated video. The RANs will simply have to continue modernizing and embracing new technologies to evolve. And so, sure, Cipri, Obsai, uh, they're not going away anytime soon. They'll be complemented with uh, mid-haul uh, capabilities and sure, in the limit, at some point, everything will transform to next generation networks. But you know, you tend to have a, a mixed bag of, of different technologies all at once. That's the industry we're in, that's the reality. It's our job to make sure they all work as seamlessly and as with the highest performance as possible. And that's what we do. Okay, Jim, thanks a lot uh, for sharing your thoughts with us today. And um, this was a conversation of, uh, on um, uh, backhaul, front haul, axle. And uh, this is from uh, a report by Sense of Healy in, published in collaboration with uh, RCI Wireless News. Jim, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, uh, listening to us.